Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to uh, session two on chapter six of Through the Mists. I'm still feeling pretty shaky emotionally today, so, um, and my uh, safety guard, AJ, is busy with other things, so let's see how we go, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm calling on uh, a higher power <laughs> to take over the show, so. I guess that's the point, in the end anyway. <laughs> I'll just wait, for, there's a few more people just coming in at the back, I'll just wait for them. I wanted to give everyone a free pass to be really blunt this session. I was hoping you already felt you had one, but... Uh, <laughs> I wondered if perhaps... Um, Anyone wanted to share, did anyone, does anyone want to fess up to finding this chapter quite difficult? Yeah, quite a lot of us, yeah. And I think that's um, where, partly where I missed the boat last week as well. I think it's difficult for a lot of us for a lot of reasons, that's probably good to chat about. Um, so again, there's like a hundred points that I'd love to cover with you. <laughs> But would anyone like to just start off with saying what emotions were brought up reading this chapter as a whole, you know? what I know some of you have told me privately you kind of went to sleep, can't get through it, read it once. Suze, do you want to share what you, you were telling me about? Yeah. Yeah, I, we were talking about something else, but it came up that, that I, I'd read them all... I, well, certainly the first book, two or three times before, Excellent. and and really loved it. And the first time, I cried all the way through it. I felt like it really opened my heart. I understood God better. And it's like my favourite go-to book. Yeah. This time around, it's like all I can see is repentance everywhere <laughs> I look on every page. <laughs> I'm so worried that I've done all this to you guys because that's exactly where I'm at. <laughs> Somehow I've created a... Uh, yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think we should blame you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I don't know why I'm laughing so much now because it's really, you know, it's... The, uh, before I came to the last lesson, yeah. I sat down and I wanted to go through it again and I sat at the table... And it took me an hour and a half to read it twice. And I literally had to keep waking up. I would read it and fall asleep and, and felt nauseous. And all I wanted to do was go and lay on the couch and go yeah. to sleep. Yeah. And, and I haven't got to the bottom of exactly what that's about, but it's really neon that it's... That there's you know, something there's there. There's something huge there. Yeah, and, yeah. And for me, it seems mostly to be... Rep I'm about really repent. reflecting about my children. And, yeah. yeah, my son's just had his first child and I, the pregnancy was difficult and the birth was difficult and it's just the realisation of all those things that are the product of fear and particularly my fear. Yeah, you're yeah. seeing, starting to... And I think that's what I remarked on when we spoke on the phone mm -hmm. was that the first time you read it, it opened you up to God and, yeah. wow, God's love is real. And then as we keep going, as, as is natural, we hit other levels of resistance yeah. of like, oh, if I want to get closer to God, I'm going to have to take this next step into like really seeing myself and Absolutely. what I've done. Yeah. And there's another layer of, you yeah. know, resistance that needs to yeah. be peeled there, back. So There just comes a time when it dawns that it's, nothing's going to happen without the repentance. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. Barbara, did you have something to add to that? Um, the chapter was a difficult chapter for me, but I um, and a, a look I had to try about four times to read it. To be honest, did you understand why, um, or did it come up? You know why? Um, it was all encompassing. Out of all the chapters, this covered so much. I felt it covered so much of God's love, our responsibilities, um, what we've done to others, what we've yeah. done to ourselves. Yeah. I just felt. This, all of the other chapters were leading up to this one. Um, and it was, there was a lot of big stuff in this. You there know, we is. haven't even talked about the mercy and the justice and, the, and, and, um, and all of that yet. That's yet still in this chapter. Yep. 
and, and that's big in itself. I think also at the start of the chapter, what's happening at the start of the chapter? You know, we know the chorale is happening, but how would we describe that? It's, it's an event that's very, what, what would you, how would you describe it? Significant, Significant beautiful, divine, loving, colourful. It's sensory, isn't it? There's, there's sensory overload of, the, you know, God's presence, healing, gifting, colours, beauty, all of these things. And so can anyone feel why there might be a resistance to reading about that? Jennifer? For me, it was just because it was all so completely new to my reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you go behind to Tim, yeah? Yeah, sort of. Um, I've got a, a mixed feelings with the chapter. Like I've got a strong affection for it, but also have this you know, corresponding opposing feelings coming in and... I sort of realised that when it starts to speak of those things and how how loving, like truly loving it is, I find yeah. that um, although like a re- the reality hits my soul that although I believe that I've, I have love or, you know, I believe that loving things occur inside my soul, I just, I still don't believe love is real. Yeah. So whenever it comes to drawing a picture about actual love, it's almost like this blind spot just overcomes me throughout the book. Yeah, the kind of resistance that would make you want to go to sleep or, you know, tune out. Tune out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. When I, yeah, if we come forward to Deirdre, but just before you speak, when I first read this a couple of years ago, I was like, I can't, I can't get the imagery. I can't get it. What do they say? I can't, no, I have to read that again. And it was all uh, realised now, all about the emotional resistance to just perceiving that level of beauty and the grief that it was bringing up for me. Yeah. Deirdre? Hi. When I first read it the first time and, and I read it now, it was like I didn't even read it the first time. Like, and for this time, it wasn't even emotional for me. It just trying to intellectually... Understand it. Understand it. And because yeah. it was like sensory overload, just trying to picture it. Yes. I couldn't even touch me emotionally. Yeah. It was just too foreign. Yeah. Too alienated. It was like, yeah, I couldn't even describe that. But you kind of get the gist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just total new world. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, let's go over here. If we go to Lizzie and then we'll go behind you, yeah. Um, I'm feeling a bit differently in that when I read it, I could actually imagine myself there. Yeah. Totally. And it meant um, so much to me, like, why aren't I there now? Yeah. And then when you said it was only... Like it was the second sphere and then here I am. And I think how degraded I am. It was the reality of that. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm not anywhere near what they're portraying in the book. Yeah, So yeah. it made me feel um, very, very low and very sad and really depressed actually. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks, Lizzie. Um, if we go behind, I think that um, that's a lot of... There's levels to how willing we are to uh, feel that level of grief about how... So if we're not willing to feel that grief, we have to try and tackle it intellectually or we tune out. Um, But when we're willing to actually sit with it, and and I had to do that myself this week, just sit with it and, you know, give myself permission to just sob about it, um, then I could connect more with what what, what, what it was bringing up, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, behind you. Yeah. Hi. Um... I actually loved the first part of this chapter. It was just so full of beauty. Like there's music, there's aroma, there's plants, there's colour, there's all these natural therapies used to support the healing process. Not to actually do the healing, but to support it. And also one other, so, so different from my religious upbringing, which I thought heaven was a bit materialistic. Yes, Um, yeah. And so I went the other way thinking, no, there's not going to be any buildings, there's not going to be any man-made structure, we're all just going to live in nature. Yeah. But in this chapter it says that the man-made building actually enhances nature yeah, and, and vice versa. and vice versa. Thank you for bringing up two points that I really <laughs> wanted to discuss. Just um, beautiful. Beautiful. Um, this idea that 
architecture can be harmonious with nature and the two can complement each other, I think is a really powerful thing that's being demonstrated in this chapter that's so often overlooked on the planet, isn't it? Mm. Um, and what a feeling it, it brings up in, your heart, in my heart anyway, the thought that, wow, we could do this. We could create buildings and uh, we could live in harmony with nature to such a degree that everything is beautiful and comfortable, but nothing's being harmed. It's all just adding... Yeah. And it's only the second sphere. And it's like, only the it's second just sphere. like, how much more can there be? Yeah. yeah. It's just such a different picture to what, one, I was taught. Yeah. And secondly, that I sort of went to on my own, not wanting the first picture. Yeah. But this is just so much better. Awesome. Yeah. So I guess for some of us, it's bringing up grief of the lack of beauty that we feel we've had. For some of us, it's hope of the possibilities. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sandra? Oh, sorry. Actually, you wanted to say, didn't you? Thanks. Right? Sorry. And if we go to Sandra behind you after. Yeah, I found the, the first... Well, the whole chapter I found absolutely beautiful. And um, I needed to read the first few pages several times, even several sentences. I'd go back and so that I was wanting to really get the visual of it. Mm -hmm. And then there was something I wrote down. It says, every stone and feature apparently throbbing with the spirit of mercy and forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah, it was like it was just hard, to, and it was overwhelming for me to get it that God loves us so much. And of course, then it stirs my personal unworthiness issues. But it was so so beautiful, yeah. so much love. That's great. Yep, yep. Okay. More emotional responses? Yeah, yeah, very similar actually, especially like when it came to the part of Siamedes and how he was described, it was too overwhelming and brought up so much unworthiness yeah. from childhood and how these children were being healed by him and just to have, you know, recognition that this is possible was just way too much. So obviously it brought up a lot of, um, yeah, unworthiness and how much God loves us. Yeah, similarly, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, did anyone feel angry reading this chapter? Suze, yep. It's interesting, I was just reflecting because there's a whole gamut of emotions, but I think I actually felt jealous of Siamedes, that somebody could be so magnificent, so mm -hmm. pure of heart, so gifted. Yep. It just seems like so far away yep. from where we are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks for being honest about it. I've And... Um, if we go to Araya at the back, actually, next, Kel. But um, someone wrote to me and said they also felt quite, you know, irritated reading it. Like, what is this? Oh, why don't I connect to this? And I think it's a lot of these feelings that some of you are talking about, about the, the lack of beauty or the why can't I receive this? Why are these special people receiving this? Yeah. And these are all... The reason I'm bringing this up is that these are things that will block us from... Well, these are the emotions for us to feel, and this is the gift of reading it, is that if we can be conscious that we don't have to love every moment of it, we just have to stay connected to ourselves, and it's going to show us the injuries that are inside of us. So that's why, what I meant by the free pass, you know? It's okay to say, I don't get it, this is crap, I don't like it, you know, if that's what's going on, because it, there's going to be stuff to learn in there. Yeah. Araya? Well, just on the similar note with feeling the richness of the environment and how everything's throbbing and pulsing in every sense, but not just the surroundings and the building, the people involved are yeah. giving 150% of what they are to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And talking about that last week of what could be created if we came in that space Definitely. has given me time to reflect on, well, am I giving that much to the teams I'm in? Am I giving that much to whatever activity I'm in my day? Yeah. You know, um, Awesome. Just the richness of all aspects of it, including the people involved. Yeah, and I think that's a beautiful point um, because that's how much, if we're going to create something like that, that's how much we're going to give of ourselves and we're going to want to give that. <laughs> so anything that's blocking me from that desire to do that, oh, I could look at that as an issue of love. Yeah, yeah and if we're not feeling that we're able to give that or not giving that, why aren't we? Exactly. Are we in our real passion or yeah. are we just not diving in? Yeah. What fear is there, you know, or yeah, what false, false belief or fear is there blocking that? Yeah, awesome. Thank you.
If we go across to Karen. When you mentioned anger, I remember that when I first read it a few years ago, that was the chapter that made me the angriest. <laughs> because yep. it was too bright and it was too colourful and I don't like that much glitter and bright and colour and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have that so much this time. I, I read it and I thought, oh, it's not as bad as I remember it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you think it could be the first time you read it, it was so overwhelming, the beauty, that you didn't want to be overwhelmed by that much? I think I've just liked dull colours all my life. I don't, I don't know. I, I, Karen, I was, you know I what angry. I reckon? I reckon there is a, there's a grief in you yet to go to around beauty. Yeah. And there's a judgment of beauty of things really beautiful that is guarding that, that grief, if you like, if yeah. you know, get my metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Julie, thanks, Kelly, for doing the mic. Is this just talking? Oh, yes, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say I was really, you were so wound up in the whole beautiful dialogue and, and, and how nature and all the beauty, but then Fred becomes really serious mm -hmm. and the dialogue completely changes for him yeah. and he brings forth a really serious side and I was really taken back because up till now you haven't really heard that side of, of, of his character yep. to say, hear me well. Yeah. Everything that happens on earth doesn't change. Yes. So I was really, yeah, it just covers everything. It covers the beauty of the ceremony, the, the whole environment. But also he talks about, well, you need to look at yourself. Yes. And... and there again is another reason why this chapter can get hard. And it's good for us to spend our time on this chapter because it's going to keep coming up as we go along. This call to look at ourselves. And um, it's not often on earth at the moment that we're called to look at ourselves. And very often we uh, like to shift the blame. And Fred's being told very clearly that you can't. <laughs> that you come... Um, what page is it? 74 be not, and 76. Um, be not deceived. The diseases of the soul re resulting from personal sin are only removed and cured by slow and painful processes. <laughs> yeah. Like, dun, dun, uh -oh. dun. <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip that sentence. <laughs> so what, what are they referring to there about the slow and painful processes? What law is that? Compensation. Yeah, the law of compensation. So Fred's being educated here about really the truth of the soul and the... I just want to find... Um, the coral, colliery nature, so that it correlates between your life here and after you pass. The, it's all related. It's, you can't ignore... And he's being told in no uncertain terms. As, as we it touched on in earlier chapters, but here he's being told, this is it. Hypocrisy, sham and cant are masks which are torn off as you come through the mists. And the real man, whether base or noble, stands undisguised, able to read and to be read of all men. With us, no subterfuge is available for the concealment of unpleasant deformity, no matter whether it arises from your own sin or the neglect and criminality of another. Everything is known. So, and this is the start of where we start to get quite serious in the chapter, isn't it? And it's, I think it's beautiful that in Fred's, the way he's told the story, he's married those two things together because he's saying, yes, this beauty is possible and this amazing thing happens, but hey, this is the truth that underpins it all. And it's, it's not all, um, what was the thing in the other chapter? Harps and clouds and things, you know. There's a real base, there's a real um, cornerstone that this whole um, spirit world is built on and it's built on truth and and people having to account for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Barbara. Barb here, yeah. 
Um, I really enjoyed that section when he talked about those truths because he used plain, simple language. There was no need for him yes. to be flowery or yeah. or extravagant in his um, vocabulary. He just got to the point and it was straightforward and simple and I appreciated that. Yeah, yeah, mm. that is good, isn't it? Because yeah. sometimes you can get lost in the flower exactly. and think, well, hang on, but there, there is a lot of uh, content here. Um, I just wondered if... We, we're going to bite off justice, mercy and this whole um, purpose of earth life. I just wondered, there's a couple of points that come earlier in the chapter. Are you happy for us to cover them before we get into the really heavy stuff? Well, need not be heavy, but, you know, the meaty stuff, the vegan meaty stuff, uh, <laughs> the tofu stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, Glenda mentioned the nature blended and the, the beautiful uh, um, complementary nature of things. But you also, you also mentioned the, heal, the, the healing qualities that were inherent in different plants and things and the way they were used. And I just wondered if that brought up any questions for anyone about the use of natural remedies and things like that. Yeah, Sandra? Yeah, I thought it was amazing how the music made the flowers and the, and the um, fruit because I always had this belief that that's, that's what heals because it brings so much joy and so much um, appreciation when you're consuming it or smelling the flower or whatever and the fruit. So I thought, like, wow, that's just... And then they were bathed in this um, mm -hmm. essence, you know? And yeah. that was and the ultimate healing at the end, right? Like... Yeah, well, it was a, it was part of the the completion of the healing. Yeah. yeah, but even the mosses. Do you remember the mosses as they came in? They gave off a certain uh, like a, an odor and a healing quality. Yeah. So, so what do you what do you think about that though? In terms of like God and divine love, yeah. and how does it all fit together? It fits like in my own lack of the, the, all the lack I feel. It confronts it because then I'm able to see how much abundance God has given in those things in nature and yeah. how really to feel that and confront all of that lack that I feel inside of myself. And yeah. I have, because of the chapter, I've been able to connect to, to that abundance that God created for us and how much love there is in all of that. And it's just, I've always felt it, but this time it's kind of hitting me really, like the truth of it is really becoming an emotional truth, which is really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think? Oh, if, maybe if we go to Glenda. Yeah. I just felt that it clarified a lot of the natural healing processes for me. Like, it's, it's good to use them. And I know a lot of people in the, that I have spoken to, including myself, have questioned, oh, you know, that's natural love and maybe we shouldn't be using that in our journey to divine Great. love. Great. This is the question but I this, want to talk about. Yeah. This clarifies to me that all, like, colour therapy, light therapy, music therapy, aromatherapy, all of those natural therapies are used as a support to us and they're God-given abundance. But it's not the be-all and end-all. We can't use those as a substitute for the, the final healing process, which is only what yeah, I can well, do with God. Well, let's refine it even more. Why do you think AJ and I don't... Um take herbal remedies or recommend herbal remedies to people? If we know that God's given us some of these things that, and they do have healing properties. If we go to Alex, maybe. Um, is it because there's uh, too much of a reliance on that? Um, um, yeah. Or can it, be. It can be. It, people it, can... Yeah. can um, view it as the answer, as Glenda pointed out, rather than knowing a higher truth, if we can put it that way. Yeah. So the way I see it is healing your soul and knowing your soul is the quickest, easiest, believe it or not, quickest and easiest and most effective way to heal yourself. But I do agree that all these other modalities are elements of things that God has given us that do have a healing impact upon us. But it's never going to be as effective or as... Um, um, what was the other things I just said? You know, permanent, um, fast, rapid uh, ways to heal. Yep, go. I oh, just... What I found in my own experience was there was too much reliance in the past on, on um, external 
you know, movies, music, all sorts of stuff to try and get into emotion. Yeah. Whereas now, like, I, I've just flicked all of that. Yeah. And if the desire's there and I'm already in emotion, then I use that to enhance or... Yes. And, and that's yeah. a good point. Do yeah. you see how it's used in this example? Yes. Is it, it's used to enhance yeah. a greater process, isn't it? Yeah. It's not the base modality, it's used to enhance and there's already a desire that is leading this process, yeah. There's also another really interesting um, thing that I want to try and explain to you, uh, if I can get my words around it, and that is that when a person is in a certain soul condition, things like, um, and, and say if someone's in a low condition, quite removed from God, um, and they've got quite a lot of damage in their soul, certain things like different herbal remedies will actually have a positive impact upon their physical body. So now I'm talking about the physical body here, not the soul. It will, it will um, have an impact of healing or maintaining the physical body. Whereas the soul, in a high, the soul's um, highest purpose or function would naturally already be doing those things. But when we're living in disconnection from our soul or our soul's not in a great condition, our soul doesn't have that power to maintain the physical body in the way that God designed it to, to happen. So, but that's how much God loves us. Even in that condition, he's given us gifts like herbal remedies and things around us that will help our physical body to continue to survive and ultimately long enough that we have the opportunity to understand, you know, the truths of God. Um, but once, once we raise our condition, our soul's in a better condition, perhaps in more connection with God, but even not just in a better condition, then it's able to, the energy of the soul is able to service the spirit and physical bodies to a much greater degree. And those same herbs are not going to have any effect because our soul's already providing that effect. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Which I, um, when I feel about that, I just feel it displays so much love that God has for us that even in a lessened condition, he's, gener he's generated this entire environment, as we talked about in other sessions, you know, nature, different aspects of nature that have a physical effect on our body, uh, sound, light, colour, all these things that can actually revive our um, physical body and help us to feel good, even when we're in a lower condition. Once we're in a higher condition, our soul's going to do that for us naturally. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was beautiful. And so that's why, remember someone asked last week about the chorale, the way it happened. And someone asked AJ, does that only happen in the second sphere? And he said, as it was occurring there, yes. Because if someone's in a higher sphere of development, they wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily happen in the same way because their, their soul, their spirit body wouldn't have the same kind of um, needs in order to heal. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. All right, Nina, you had your... Did you want to ask something? No? That's all right. You don't have to. For me, it's a question I've pondered on a lot. This one is when to use um, natural remedies and when to rely on the soul. And This is why I was like, guys, didn't anyone yeah, think of this? Uh, I'm reading it. I've, I've been praying <laughs> about this the whole time I've been on the Divine right. Love Path. And what I've come to is how do I want to help someone and... You can take someone off allopathic medicine and put them onto natural remedies and that's a more loving choice for them at that time and something they're ready for and they may not be ready for the emotional journey at that point. So it really is... See, I think we're always ready. Yeah. <laughs> it's a decision. It's based on desire. You know, it's not that someone's not going to be able to cope with it. And this is where we also have to be careful, I think, like... Um, if I, I understand what you're saying, I'm just saying be careful of giving you, of like, I uh, can't think of any other way to say insulting God's truth. <laughs> because when we say that a person, that, um, that someone is not ready for God's truth in its pure form, we're actually saying, I know better than God about this. <laughs> um, this person actually can't cope with the, truth that the creator has 
given to me or, you know, has given to all of us. Um, so I'll just, like, ease it in or I'll just give them this thing. Do you understand what yeah. I'm... Yeah. yeah. Um, that's where I feel we have to be, to, to be careful. If we know a higher truth and yet we feel... Most often it's fear that prevents us presenting that truth, which we disguise then as, oh, if I tell Kel, I don't, and she's not really there yet. You know, I had to go through this, this and this before I was ready to hear about it, and she hasn't done that. So I'll just give her this herbal remedy and say, see how you go with that. Come back and see me if you, you know. It, can you see it's almost quite condescending to yeah. Kelly immediately? Yeah. It's saying, not, not only do I know better, it's not giving her a choice. Mm. Um, and it's also saying, if I say to Kelly, Kelly, do you know what the truth is? You've got a soul that is impacting on everything in your life. And I could give you, you know, we could talk about that for half an hour if you like, because it's changed my life and it could probably change yours. And I can see how these particular issues completely relate to your soul. Um, now, she's got the choice then to say yes or no, and she might get angry, which is usually the thing we makes us think, we'll give them the herbal remedy. <laughs> yeah. Or the fact that we feel like a reliance or an attachment or an affection for the herbal remedy, you know, above God's truth, because for ourselves in our own life, God's truth feels a bit too hard or a bit too challenging for ourselves personally, and it makes us keep this preference for, for another thing. Does that answer your question? Mm. Yeah, cool. Uh, if we go to Elaine, at, just if you keep your hand up, Elaine, yep. How I felt, and I may not be correct, was the people that from the, the corral that were in that condition assisted with their love to create all those things that were coming around. So they were showing, demonstrating by example, but also, it coincidentally, the people in the lower condition automatically helped them to wake up to God's truth. You know what I uh, don't quite get what you mean. Well, it, nothing was coincidental that happened at the corral. So, um, The people in the, the higher soul condition yep. assisted to create all the beauty around. Yep. And they didn't purposely go out to provide that herb for the, for the people, but the people in the lower condition were smell breathing in those things and awakened them to what the actual message was, which is a message from God. No, I got no, that wrong. No, everything that was used there was on purpose. So okay. everyone who was involved, so we had Kushna and uh, Sy Syamedes and... Mm. He, it was just the two of them orchestrating the, what went on. And remember, there's a very beautiful part where Siamese's calls on God, which is, I want to talk about that next, um, to assist with the healing. So everything is actually quite planned and orchestrated. And as AJ spoke about last week, the biggest healing energy comes from God. And, and that was the beautiful part. And if you remember at the beginning, there's actually a part where it's um, visually depicted the God's blessing going on to everyone present. Um, and then everyone's adding, as Araya said, like they're giving their all, they're giving themselves to this common purpose of, of the healing. So everything that happens there is very purposeful. And even, and that was sort of the point I was trying to make, even the herbs and the fruits and the sounds and everything is actually being used as a healing modality in that place. For these people who have injuries, they have injuries upon their soul that these things are helping to remove. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah. the actual, the love from God coming to everyone, no matter what their path had been, whether it was Judaism, Christianity, yep. the culture, yep. was what really impressed me, actually. It's very beautiful, wasn't it? The part where they said, um, all nations were unified. Page 66, I think that's on. That was... Um... So then, Mary, could I just ask on the yep. back of that, sure. what is the difference with that as opposed to people who are herbalists or is what where's the gap there compared yep. to that yeah and I should clarify as well I think I said those things were healing their soul those things are actually acting on their spirit body not their soul yeah yeah Sorry, they didn't not... have a physical body anymore because they've passed uh, yeah so 
So those modalities were all there to help support the spirit body because their things are being removed from the yep. spirit body which and they they're actually tr- trying to rejuvenate these people enough that they're able to actually consciously enter this life which is what I was trying to say <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah. But the yeah. distinction between a herbalist on earth yeah. is really very little difference to what I've just explained in that herb, herbs and different natural remedies can have an effect, a healing or a maintaining effect, if we say, I think uh, is a better way to say it, on our physical body. Um, but that's not going to impact upon the soul of the person but it can maintain your physical body if your soul is in such a condition that it's degraded. And, and like most of us are in that condition where, you know, I'm getting grey hair and, you know, things are happening to my body, which is signalling ageing, which is actually showing that my soul is not maintaining my body in the way that God designed it. So um, the herbalist on earth has the capacity to assist a person to keep their physical body going but it's not going to impact upon the soul and most generally they don't not always but often they don't take god into account at all within that no no whereas here they were taking god into account. absolutely the primary healing modality was god's love yeah, yeah. thank you no worries sheridan next to you um i wondered if um uh like Fred's law of attraction being in the audience, whether he had a desire to heal, so he was actually learning and all the beauty that was there was also opening up everyone's soul more that was in the audience, contributing to the healing as well. Like yeah. Were you here last week, Sheridan? No. I no, wasn't. that's all right. That's a good point. We talked a little bit about it last week, but it was a bit befuddled because I was not in a good space. But AJ talked about it with clarity and that was that um, there was a definite the law of attraction was in play for everyone there and we can see it strongly for Fred because of the life he lived on earth so in two ways one is that so these people where the injuries were being removed from their spirit bodies they're people who had been victims of circumstance society had kind of crushed them into it into a way of living that they didn't agree with. And that applies to Fred. So it's quite beautiful then that he gets to... He wasn't as oppressed as these people, but he experienced similarities in his life. But also he had a deep desire to serve people. And so that is part of what drew him to the chorale naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And also that the people there, like God's love, could do the healing, but having the people there was also a gift to them and helped them in their growth, every single person there. So, yeah, well, very thanks. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, someone's... Oh, yeah, Di's had a hand up for a while. It, it's on a different aspect. Of, sure. But just something else that really um, struck me when I was reading it was the desire in them for God was just so much more than I have now and... Yep. And it really, really struck me about the limitation of my soul now um, yep. in where I'd like to go and and feeling how overwhelmed I felt by just the leap to get to where they are. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd like to talk about um, when Siamidis calls on God and the qualities he displays. So, but I'm aware there's a few other hands up. So let's go to them first and then we'll go to Siamidis. So Araya had a hand up and some other people here. Julie, who else? Yep. Yeah, just a quick question because it's on that note. Yes. Of the audience and all the different nationalities present. Yep. And I had a question because at the end it says... Um, one of those, the narrow-minded sectarian sat side by side with the Wylam atheist... Yes. Is he just speaking metaphorically there because an atheist couldn't really be present in that audience? Yes, I think he's referring to who everyone, how they would have defined themselves on earth. So they no longer define themselves as a Hindu, a Jew, a Christian, a, uh, an atheist or any of those things. It's just that on earth they were these people, that's how they lived out their life and now they're all together um, saying our Father to the self-same God. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Mary, um, just on the same... Th- um, sorry? It was just with... Hang- yes, while means former. Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Mary. Um, well, just yeah. with that same question, I could not understand when it said the Jew was not conscious of election. 
what what is that? It's a reference to Jewish culture. I, um, yeah, what's yeah? Sorry, I just didn't understand. I understood all the others, the other different um, races, but the I'm Jew- I'm not sure if this. I've yeah, Deb, go ahead. I feel it's because Jewish people feel that they are the chosen people. Chosen one, yeah. yeah so they're the elect God. people, and the others yeah. are Gentiles. So he's saying Everybody they're no Jewish. longer conscious of that feeling. They, they don't have that anymore. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Rose? I just love this book with all its juicy vocabulary. And just coming <laughs> back good, to a bit it? about the atheist, the word, and I have no idea how you pronounce it, Will, Willem? Willem, yes. Means and that's once formally atheist. Yes, yes, formally. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's quite a, did anyone have a, like a list? I had a list of about 10 words from this. Um, yeah. Only 10? <laughs> Only 10. <laughs> Uh, All right. Okay, any other questions around that before we move on? Uh, Yep. Um, Nora? Sorry for my pointing. This goes quicker than my mouth. (laughs) That's okay. Yeah, I think I... um, Yeah, I wanted to, if that's okay, go back to the point before with the remedies. If you just go to your mouth. Go back to the point before with the remedies. Yes, sure. Okay. Yeah, um, I, um, I've been battling with, it and wrestling with this um, issue myself too for the last two years. And um, I decided not to actually use any of these remedies because, of course, they don't treat the causal. Um, but I had people coming to see me and desperately wanting help, and I'd refuse to give them the help. And then I thought, well, is that loving? And I Did you offer them God's to, truth? Yes, Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I said, if I do this, then I won't be um, honest with myself and I won't be helping you. And so I'm taking responsibility for your life. And, it's, you know, it's, it's, I'm not saying you have to do this, but this is what I'd like to do. So they went away. They fe- I felt that were really, quite really angry at me. And um, that's so not my point. That's not what's my your problem. Question? My, my what's question your question? Is, is it loving... To turn someone out like, down like this when they're actually suffering, and that's what I did. But then I question myself, and I still do. Um, what I do these days is, okay, I offer them the, I offer them the choice, and if they say, well, I uh, know I really like to, I like to help your your help today, yep. so then I do give them my help because yep. I think that. Doing the other is not is not loving. So yeah, it's, but I'm not sure. So your question is really, if someone comes to you and they have got a, a physical problem, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah? it is. Yes, and well, you it's a manifestation of the soul. Of yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, and you offer them divine truth. Yes, and they turn it down. Mm-hmm. You're saying, is it loving to help them or turn them away? Yes. Yeah. What, what does everyone more, the, think? What is the most loving? What is the most loving thing to yes. do? Okay, Karen at the back. Uh, for me, the similar situation, um, it was easily resolved because I just felt so uncomfortable um, offering them something that I didn't believe was really helping them. It was yeah. actually slowing down the possibility of helping them. Yeah. So it's my own feeling that stopped me. Yep, yeah. Because you're speaking in your experience as a doctor, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Anyone else on this, Jen, before we say? Yep. For me, it feels like what love would do would be to, um, to do whatever I could to assist without taking responsibility for the other person. Mm-hmm. So if a person came to me in need... I would do whatever I could to help, assist. If I knew the person was taking responsibility for their feelings and emotions and the journey in life, I would still do and support whatever in every way, whatever way, and so then leave it be. So the opposite of taking responsibility would be someone who's um, demanding. If I wanted to rescue, or I, if wanted you wanted to, to rescue, find a solution for them or give them guidance that wasn't asked for, or yeah. 
that sort of stuff. So it sounds like if there was addiction present in yourself or them, then you would hesitate. Is that fair to say? Um, I think the place that I'm at is that I know that I don't have the answers. So I would be praying, praying with them, for them, but I just would do... If it was a cup of tea and that helped, <laughs> that it would be as simple as that. Okay, if all right. It, if Let's... it was the last dollar in my pocket, then that, if that helped, then... I would do that. And this is where, this is where we're going to get into the area where there is no one definitive answer because it is not a case of A plus B equals C. It's, you know, what is the true nature of A and what is the true nature of B and that is going to equal the decision I make. Yeah. So Alex had his hand up. Uh, I just felt that I would speak truth yet honour their free will yep. and say, look. So you, you would honour your free will, but the point Karen raises is honouring her own free will, no, isn't honouring it? Honouring their free will, yeah. Yes. So that's what I mean. Yep. But, so you'd honour their free will. Yeah, absolutely. But also you have to honour your own free will, yeah, don't you? Yeah, So both people's free will. Sure. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So if you have some, some kind of healing modality that you've offered in the past and this person's coming to you and you offer them divine truth, they say, no, I don't want it, um, then it comes back to now the feelings inside of yourself, the assessment of... Look, am I aiding someone in addiction? Mm. Is this actually just a demonstration of compassion or something that, you know, is going to ease extreme suffering that I would do this for them? Am I helping them avoid? Or does it just feel wrong for me now to do something that I know is not going to help them in the long term, you know? So there's, I feel there's a lot of moral and ethical decisions that rest upon the... And it's never going to be, that's it, I'm never going to use herbal medicine again. I've not said that, <laughs> you know. Um, my God, two years ago, I was like, childbirth, I'll be the epidural thing. <laughs> I don't feel that anymore. But, you know, th there's, there's going to be um, moral and ethical decisions to make in the inside of the person to decide whether or not it's loving to give this thing. Sorry, you were going to say something else. Oh, it was just, uh, I guess, taking into account of what you said previously about... Um you know, these natural rem remedies can also assist the physical body. Yes. So in keeping that person alive, this just raises another question, keeping the person alive and physically well for longer may give them the opportunity to later on feel like, hang on, I'm at that place again now. Yep. And maybe there's something else that I'm missing. Definitely. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And this is where we can't become compassionless people. Like if we have love, we're going to see the person in front of us and we're not going to be callous to their suffering ever if we really love them. Now, we may not act to alleviate all of their suffering all of the time, but if we have true love inside of us, we'll have compassion for what they're going through. And that may mean at times that we act to help them in their suffering for that very reason. And because as we go on in the chapter, we learn that God is displaying mercy here on earth to give us more time to come to see ourselves. So um, I think it's, it's very variable and it's individual. I used to work in a hospital ward where a lot of people were in hospital for a long time and people's lives were being extended and extended and extended and extended and they were, had no quality of life and they were terminally ill, most of them, you know, with, in very harsh conditions, not seeing the outside for six months at a time. Now, in those situations, I don't, I don't know that I would continually when someone's almost comatose all of the time, they're already kind of leaving this life and to prolong their life all of that time, I don't think they're going to take that opportunity. But I don't know. I used to stand up for some patients and say, hey, no, you can't make that decision for them. They have to make the decision. So, yeah, it's individual, I think. And we, this is where we have to rest on the principles that we're learning and not use it A plus B equals. Yeah, yeah. Okay, lots of hands went off then. Oh my gosh. Um, if you just go beside you, Alex, to one. 
Um, just with what you were saying, I have a problem with with that, and I feel really compelled that to prolong, um, like, to avoid the truth of where where we're at by using something to to extend it. It seems I feel it's really untruthful. Like, I know I lack probably compassion for people like you were saying you'd want to ease someone's suffering, but I feel like just be like. <laughs> straight down the line. Like, Can you see that's the way you treat yourself, Mon? Well, and it doesn't I'd actually like help that. you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Well, it doesn't actually help you when you're really harsh on yourself. You know, when you go, no, nah, that's the truth and I'm going to get it. You, you're not, can you feel the feeling inside of you is not love for yourself? Um, it's like forcing of, it's judgment of the error. Yeah, yeah. but I feel like that's... <laughs> Like that's the only way to do it. I don't feel like you can be compassionate or like it has to be hard. It has to be like there is no. You can't give someone the easy way or the, you can't give someone the, the loving, the loving thing. Like, and can I don't you feel like they will help. Yeah. And it's just an error in you, sister. <laughs> because can you see how then we begin to, re- to superimpose those feelings onto God? It's very hard for us to imagine a compassionate God when we feel like love is actually being easy on you. Love is being easy, yeah. Really from what you said, the feeling you have is love is actually letting yourself off the hook and being easy on yourself. Yes. Yeah. That- when love is not, love is very powerful and it is firm for truth, but it's not, um, it's not harsh, it's not punishing, you know. And this is the, the line, I think, lots of us, I, and I observe lots of you guys get in this place where you go, that's the truth, I am doing it, that is it, right? And it's, you're actually putting upon yourselves things that were put upon you as children and when there's no love accompanying the truth, it's not really a powerful truth. And we have to practice this with ourselves as well. And then we'll find it easy to practice it with each other. Yeah. So can I ask you then, Mary, like what is then compassion? Because I struggle with compassion for myself. And I don't know if you said that before, but yeah. I struggle for compassion for myself and for others. And I know that you say, like, Fred is really compassionate. <laughs> And I don't understand, I don't understand that. Yeah. Mon, I don't know if I'm the most qualified to answer this question, (laughs) but something that comes to me is about God's grace, like how much God loves us. And if you can, every time you catch yourself judging yourself, and by that I mean saying, I am less than or I'm bad because of this thing in me, if you can recognise that that's not how God sees you, even intellectually first, and say, oh no, God's still loving me and he's just seeing this wound inside of me and, and now I'm acting out of this wound. And just, just seeing it in that way rather than seeing it and immediately, immediately trying to punish or eradicate it from yourself rather than just being with the pain of it, I feel that will help you a lot towards compassion for yourself and other people. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. If if I have any more inspiration, I'll uh, let you know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, If we go to Jen behind. Um, Alex's comment brought up a question for me. Um, Is is the physical life, like, because we're here listening to divine truth and divine love, is the physical life somehow... It's hard to frame the question. More important, is it important for us to stay here as long as possible? Do you know what I'm trying to ask? Should we, pro- should we stay here for as long as we can to try and get the most out of it? To help our soul to grow and... Um, that's probably a complex question uh, in that there's no definitive answer either. <laughs> I feel that... Um, 
when we're in a state of love, we recognise the gift that God has given us in this physical life and that the conditions of this physical life are different to the spirit life and therefore they do have value. He doesn't do anything on, by accident. You know, there must be a reason why this, we're given this physical body for a time and it must be because there are special gifts that we will receive if we embrace this physical life. However... God is not, like I was just saying, is not punishing or exacting or that his love is so infinite that even when we're in a degraded soul condition, we've got herbs. And even when we lose this physical body, we go to somewhere else where we just keep learning like Fred is. So um, I feel there's a lot of fear on the planet about death, which makes people hold on to life, which is not the way God designed it to be. Um, but I feel that, yes, I'm very interested in this idea of this physical life is unique in some way because only here are certain conditions happening and there must be many, more than one good reason for that and I'm, I'm intrigued to explore them all. I guess I have the feeling inside of me that's growing that I'm here, I know you guys and I'm learning the truth and that this is a marvellous opportunity and somehow I think there's also a fear there that if I don't embrace this opportunity while I'm still physical, <laughs> find my soulmate, join together, let's hurry up. Tick all the boxes. Yeah, yeah. tick all the boxes. <laughs> Emotions every day, yeah. you know, that I'm kind of missing the boat or missing the opportunity. And I think, and I, I think you've, given you, you've given away the answer in your question, Jen, and that is there's a fear in me about this. There's a fear if I don't do this. And that's the bit to heal and then you'll have more clarity. The and fear I guess that's is going why to be related I ask because, um, like, is there somehow a truth tied up in all of that, or is just the, is it just the fear that's reigning rampant here? Let's say there's definitely a truth linked up in that, but at the moment you don't see it clearly because of your fear. Thank you, Mary. No worries. Um, if we go, Sandra, and then Rita, and then we should probably get on to the part about prayer. Yep. Uh, sorry, Sandra first. Yeah. Ah. Can, can I just ask about the, you know how you said before that it's a rhetorical question in a way, like, oh, I don't know if that's the right way of describing it. But the, There's no definitive answer. Yeah. Um, is it, I guess the wise thing to do would be just to feel the intention for ourselves, what it is, like what our intention is in the Which interaction. Which question are you talking about? Um, the healing someone with yeah. herbs versus, yeah. you know, like if I look at my intention, is it loving? I probably know, and as Karen said, she'll feel what the truth of that intention is, I guess. Yeah. What is in, in there for me, maybe, what, kind of a yeah. feeling? Yeah. I don't understand your question, though. Isn't yeah. that what we said? Yeah, and that's what I'm asking, whether that's what it is. It's all about intent. Mm. Is, that, is that what you would say it is when well, you're helping? Well, no, it's not no. just about your intention. Okay. It's about the condition of the person who's in front of you and their intention and the entire situation. Mm -hmm. that you have to be willing to feel about. Yeah. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, I feel you're looking for a definitive answer. Do you see? Yes. Like rather than just feel, okay, I'm going to have to be responsible because remember this is what yes. we're learning. I'm going to have to be responsible for the actions that I take. So that means me being under, like really desiring to know myself in this situation asking God what would be the loving thing in this situation and really being willing to feel the person in front of me and to help that to help me ascertain what's loving in that whole um, encounter mm -hmm. and I'm probably wrong in saying there's no definitive answer there is a definitive answer in every mm -hmm. situation it's just that it might be different in every situation yeah. does that make sense mm -hmm. so God will have an opinion about what's loving in every situation our challenge is just to find out from God what that is. Yep. Yep. Thank you for that. No worries. Yeah. Rita? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to go back to what Jen said. And uh, I felt that chapter gave me the answer that it is much more important to stay on earth as long as we can because it says as long as we are on earth, God shows mercy but once we are dead and go through the mist, there is justice and in every detail. And it also says that the same justice can't be on earth 
because man mankind with disasters and whatever they do wouldn't survive. So God has great mercy on earth. Yes. So I really feel, if I understand that right, um, I feel it opens up for me that God is such a loving God and such a merciful God. And once we are dead, we don't have the same mercy anymore. And it speaks about that if the same mercy would be given, um, it would lessen the justice and the justice would become injustice. And it th says it on two, on two points. And I found it so eye-opening. So it's just so motivating to really be aware of the mercy we get from God and the love we get from God. And because we do wrong things every moment almost, yeah? We, so I'm not in a, um, at one with God, a very loving or whatever. And I see it in me daily, in daily interactions, or I'm in various groups and I don't notice what I say. And I'm, it's pointed out to me, or not, afterwards I notice it myself, if I see myself on the video. And I think if it's in a group and if it's pointed out, how much more is it in daily life? And I don't see it. And the chance is we have here on earth to really look at ourselves every moment and see our law of attraction every moment because we have mercy. But if I would die like that, then every single thing I did, even if I didn't know I did it, uh, or if it's my parents' issues or my grandparents' issues, but I did it with my will, because I have free will. I will be responsible for it, and I will be account, I have to, have to account for. And so, Rita, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now. <laughs> did I say something wrong? <laughs> no, just But I really to... loved that chapter the most. Rita, you're doing the it again. It's the opposite from everybody Rita, else. Rita, stop, completely stop, wrong. stop. <laughs> Rita, feel your emotions. What did you just do in the last five minutes? I mean, I cried when I read that chapter. It was the most beautiful Rita, chapter. Rita, I'm just, I'm just trying to feel about the best way I can uh, demonstrate this to you, which is why I let you go on for so long. Because there's a huge emotion driving you going on. You're not, f you're not feeling me or anyone around you. You're not connected to us at all. And you've repeated yourself three or four times. You weren't asking a question. You had a huge desire that we all listen to you. But you didn't, you didn't feel that I understood what you were saying the first time you said it. And then you couldn't feel everyone around you going, oh, oh, oh. Yep. And what was the emotion? And, and then when I, when I let you say all of that and I said, now, Rita, I'm giving you the opportunity to reflect, which is just what you just, you just literally that moment finished saying, I want to have the opportunity to reflect more. As soon as I did that, you talked over the top of me. Okay. Quite, quite um, rudely. You talked over the top of me uh, quite uh, forcefully which demonstrates to me that you didn't want to reflect on the emotion that was driving that. Yeah, thank you. I just don't get it. But I had the same question as Jan, because AJ said I'm overclocked most of the time, so that I could just die. That's the only way I get rid of those spirits. And then I realized when I was reading that... Rita, Rita, life I'm going to stop gift. you. I'm going to stop you, because... I don't, I don't think it would do you any service to talk to you about the point that you're wanting to make because I feel the real lesson is in the emotion that's driving you speaking right now. We will talk about this theme that, you, that you're wanting to talk about and there's some errors and some truth in what you're saying. But can you see that even in this moment, I'm offering you the opportunity to reflect on the emotions that are driving you to act in this way in the group, and you still want to talk about the point. I'm, I just leave it with you, just because I know it's quite confronting, and you know we are in a group and everything. No, and that's I, I, I don't mind that. <laughs> I just well, see that I'm wrong again, but I only grasp it intellectually. But I don't feel you're even grasping intellectually 
what I'm saying to you about the emotion. So I just want to give you a chance to, because I know often you reflect on these things and see them, but there's a huge emotion in you demanding, and now we're taking heaps of time of heaps of people, how many people in this room? 60 people, and we're all focused on this, this one emotion, which is fine, but just to, the emotion is a lack of regard for, for everyone around and a feeling of, I must be heard, I must say this thing, I must, and I must, and it's important, but there's a, there's a lot of feelings underneath that. There's some anger and there's some fear and a lot of grief. So I feel this is a great opportunity to reflect on th those emotions. And then we can reflect on the spirits and, you know, mercy and justice and all of those things. But if you start there, I feel that's the most powerful thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Anyone else? Oh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> that levelled it. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> Can I just say, I don't mind that because your example of how loving you were in that whole process is a huge inspiration for me. So, yeah, I don't, I don't mind that at all. It's Thanks, Alex. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love my sister, Rita. <laughs> okay. I really wanted to talk to you guys about page 72 of the printed book. Um, and if someone would do the others a service of knowing where it is on the printout, uh, so I should say the published book, that it, it starts as he spread his hands to heaven, every knee around him bent in adoration. 63? Up the top of 63. Okay. The, it, it is actually beautifully just on the one page of the um, published book. And it's, it's talking about Siamides in the chorale. He's basically asking God to assist in the healing. And I wanted, there is, I've, I have circled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 qualities he displays in that one, um, in that one passage as he's asking for God's assistance in the healing. And... I just thought it was a beautiful example of the space that we would enter when, when we are going to ask God to assist in healing. So does, who wants to uh, take a crack at finding some um, qualities that Siamides is showing us? Yep, just here. I'm sorry, what's your name? I don't know. Jane. 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 Faith. Faith, yes. Yes. Where does he... And it speaks specifically of it here. Because to me, this was such a beautiful demonstration of true faith, that there was confidence in his faith. And um, I don't know where it is in the Bible that gives the... Uh, who remembers the definition of faith as it is in the Bible? It's the um, assurances, yep, and, of things hoped for, is it? Or The assurance of things hoped for and the something... Oh, no, I'm not going to remember. Yeah. Well, let's stick with the assurance of things. Of things to come. And things, things to come. come. Okay, yeah. And, and he shows this... Like, he's not just like going, oh, God, would you mind? Maybe. Oh, I'm hoping you might. He's like stepping into it, isn't it? And he is assured that God will assist. And this is real faith. And this is the kind of faith I read about and go, wow, this is the faith I want. He says, uh, it says, um, it's about three quarters of the, or two thirds of the way down. Um, if we talk about the faith aspect, well, it's all a demonstration of faith, isn't it? But he, his prayer was done. There was no supplication. His confidence and faith declared that to be unnecessary. So he, he's confident in this in this desire in this question, in this, um, he is asking God, isn't he? Okay, what, what else is there? I've got the from, right from the, Sam? Um, I also really felt just on that paragraph there that you started yep. um, talking about, he's showing us that we can be like 
we can shine, we can be big and awesome in our presence and still be humble. Yes. And still be connected to God. Yeah. And you know what I mean? It showed me I have this error somehow that it's not okay to really just be big in my presence and, and shine. Yes. Because in that place I associate it somehow with being arrogant. Arrogant. Yeah. 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 It's beautiful, isn't it? And there yeah. is a part where it even says... Um, it's actually right at the start. I knew it, though my eyes were fixed on him who, facing me, looked like a gladiator, preparing for the contest, confident of the victory, though death itself should be his adversary. He was not proud or arrogant. All his majesty of mean, mean, the glory of his strength, the perfection of his form, seemed to him unknown, or rather for the moment were forgotten, and nothing but the childlike heart remained as he addressed his God. So I agree, Sam. It's beautiful, this picture of this majestic guy who's like confident of God, but he's not arrogant. He doesn't feel better than anyone. He's just, he's just got such a faith and a, in this relationship with, with his creator. Yeah. Awesome. It's so yeah. beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and this this idea of a gladiator. Also, what are the qualities inherent in this that he's that he's a gladiator preparing for the contest, confident of victory? So, what is he bringing? What's he bringing apart from faith, Jane? Um, he he would be bringing strength and lead it like leadership. Yeah, leadership. Well, like leadership. Yep. So he's showing leadership. Die. It's power, and it's power with love. It's loving yeah. power. Loving power, absolutely. There's something else if we go to the back to Geraldine. I feel there's courage. Courage, yes, also. Um, he's willing to face the adversary, no less than death, you know, like he's willing to face something pretty full on that's happened. Raj? A representation of those who are there for healing. Yes, yes, he's, he's willing to act on, it actually says that, doesn't it, somewhere there, that he's, you know, he's going to act on their behalf as well. Um, he was there to break the bands of captivity, to give freedom to the slave, and in his eye the assurance of the triumph shone. So he's, he's there, he wants to, and really what struck me the most is I suppose he's not passive in this relationship with God he's not going okay God come on you do the you do the business now he's going here I am God I'm bringing me I'm I'm ready to go into this with you and I know you're coming like wow yeah. <laughs> like wow <laughs> there's another quality at the end of the first paragraph that's very important in that I thought about and in, in how this can occur, there's an equality in him and in his desire. Uh, his purity. Yes, a purity of his desire. He's not in it for himself. He's not in it for the glory. He's not in it to because um, he's a bit half-hearted about it. He's like, I know God's the greatest and I know this is pain in front of me and I, my whole heart wants to do this. It's a pure desire that he wants to, to help them, yeah. Mary, also, um, yep. the, what struck me was the paradox of the gladiator with the childlike heart. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, hey. Yeah. Yeah. It's, isn't that, it's just, you know, sometimes um, Fred gets so flowery that I just go, oh, come on, Fred. Like, just say it. <laughs> but this, this passage to me was just so beautiful because I could really go there with him and see this strong man who's just, he's not full of fear. This, I think this is why the gladiator image, you know, he's, he's there, but he's childlike and he's not lording it over anyone or he's not, and he's, he's full of this faith and yeah, let's do something wonderful. Yeah. Okay. What else, what else can you see? There's another couple of other major qualities that I saw in him, Graham. I found it interesting about there was no supplication to his prayer. Yeah. You know, and I got the definition here of supplication, to ask or beg for something earnestly or humbly. And I'm thinking, okay, so he's not begging and asking for something earnestly or humbly. And I'm thinking, well, you know... Shouldn't he be doing that? <laughs> that's not prayer? No, like you said, well, that was his prayer. 
His prayer was done, yet there was no supplication. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, okay. So what do, what do, what do, let's talk about that. What do you think it means then? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> because, I'm... yeah, because we're, we're seeing this is an example where God actually came to the party. So I want to, I want to, um, <laughs> I want to duplicate this in my own life, you know. So what is it I can learn about this no supplication? I think it's I think it's a lot about the um, the verb beg in that definition. It's saying that he he was assured his faith was such that he he wasn't going please God please God please God he's going yes God I'm ready now we can act together. I think that's why that's why he's saying there's no supplication. He he's using supplication in the way of making myself small. And we're seeing that Siamides is he's confident in himself in that God will... He's more confident in God than he is in himself. So he's, that's very humble. But he's not... He's also that thing I was saying, he's willing to give himself in that as well. Do you know what I mean? So if he was going, oh, I'm small, I'm small, I'm small, then that's, suppli- that's what I think he means by supplication. And he can't act as much if he's going, I'm small. He's so- going... I'll be as big as I can be, God. And so would it be like if you have to ask for something, it means that you don't have it, whereas he's taking the approach of he's got it? Yeah, I mean, I feel he's still asking. He's still asking, but he's assured that he will get it at the same time. Does that make sense? So the, the humility is in the asking, and he's definitely humble. Um, but he's not saying... Um, I'm bad, I'm small. He's saying, I want to be everything I can be. And God, could you come? And I know you will. That's sort of how I see it. Does that you, Well, that it's, it seems like it's a challenge for me to find a way to pray without supplication. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> but I think that's what we've got to do. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's a challenge to have that level. I think it's about the level of faith. It's, it, and also resting in the knowledge that I am the greatest of cre- his creations. That's a biggie for me that I feel a long way away from. But I think that Siamides is okay with that. Like, <laughs> yeah, we do one with God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. People are leaping off their chairs at the back. So uh, is it Jen who's... Yeah. And then we'll come forward. Uh, and Tim on the other side. I'm sorry there is like a humongo light here and I keep trying to look over there but sometimes I realise I haven't seen you properly. <laughs> yep. Uh, I love faith. I just love to think about it and feel it and it feels like for me that this guy's got so much faith and his faith is so developed in that there's like this wonderful connection that comes with this level of faith between God and the person. Yep. And that, that that's a two-way thing. It's like a the conduit that like opens up the gates of conversation between God and the person is like this quality of faith that you can develop. Well, it's not really the conduit, but it is I feel it's the groundwork we need to do. Yeah, and I feel that faith also is one of these funny things. I've been talking to AJ about it lately, and he's like, babe, you just need to feel, and then you won't need to talk to me about it, and you'll know. I'm like, yep, thanks, good reminder. But um, because I'm really fascinated by the faith at the moment as well. But my feeling is, I do have some feelings about it, that it's, it's one of these things that we demonstrate faith, it's rewarded our faith grows. We demonstrate faith. But we have to, like Siamese, we have to act in faith for it to grow. Because otherwise we act in fear and it can't grow. God can't reach us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if we go to Tim and then we go to Glenda and Suzanne. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a quick feeling about um, definitions. Um, yeah. Like with what Graham was saying about being humble um, with the supplication word. Like mm-hmm. just got to be careful, I guess, with sometimes the definition of the dictionary's terms. Yeah. Because um, I think the dictionary's term of humble is actually quite different to God's definition. Yeah, very true, Tim. Good point. And also I think that 
you know, we had a lot of discussions about punishment, penalty, all of these things. Um, it's, remember there's a beautiful quote in one of the earlier chapters where Kushner is saying, I think it was Kushner saying to Fred, you have to understand the spirit of the word. If you just take the word, you lose it. And Fred's trying to always bring our emotions up, isn't he? And, and I think that this, that's why I was emphasising the small part of supplication because I think it, you know, he's trying to say he wasn't like lessening himself. He was being himself. And, but I agree, the dictionary definition of humble is quite different to the one we use. Sometimes I think when people hear us talking, they must go, what are you, what? <laughs> yeah, just a quick one. It's actually, I've got it here. It's saying um, to be low or inferior in station or quality yeah. or a cause to feel shame. Yeah, so. that's humble in the dictionary, yeah, that's, hey? That's yeah. part of the, definite, yeah, yeah. the examples of being humble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tim. Uh, who had their hand up over here? Yep, Glenda, and then Suze, and then Deb. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying one reason why I feel I need to be, or, or supplicate, whatever yep. the word is, to God, is that first of all, I don't have a very good relationship with God, and I still have errors about him being the bully, so I need to beg. And also I have errors around self-worth. So why should God give me anything I ask for? Mm. And I don't think Smeenis has those problems. No. That's right. So, and can you see why AJ's always saying humility, humility, feel it, feel it? Because once it's gone, then it opens up. It opens us up to God. So why should he supplicate to his best friend who he feels that if yeah. he's asking in a pure desire, he will get it anyway? Exactly. It's a confidence. Yes. And a knowing. Yes. And this is... And the reason I wanted to talk about this so much is because this is where, this is where we're going to go. You know, this is where we, we're going to need to go to have God act with us. And I really want to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Suzanne... Sorry, and then David after. Oh, it's just the same thing. We're yeah. only talking about faith because we don't have it. Totally. Yeah, That's yeah, what AJ is saying to me. <laughs> we, 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 we're, we're Siamese is it's only truth. It's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not sure about this, and I'm wondering if there are any uh, former Catholics in, or high Anglican in the church in the room that can clarify, but sometimes in churches they have wo words. I thought perhaps... It didn't say in the dictionary, I know, but sometimes supplication can mean a type of flowery prayer that, that oh, church. I'm okay. not entirely sure, but I yep. just sort of get that yep. feeling. It's because a lot of Christian prayers can sure. be all this, you know, you're yep. the greatest God, and you're so, yep. and it's all kind of like it's lovely, but it's not really getting to the point. Whereas uh -huh. somebody's got to the point and yep. got the work done. So perhaps that is what they're referring Possibly. to. Maybe he's saying he wasn't flowering <laughs> on; he was just. Doing and because it uh, that does fit also, Deb. But so, I'm I'm yeah. not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah. Um, okay, Jane, then Jennifer. I just wanted to say another one of his qualities awesome. was um, perfection. Perfection. Where's that? I, I wrote it down, but <laughs> at the time I wrote it down. Uh, whether it was just my um, my sort of feeling of him, like yeah. Oh, Where is it? it yes. Yeah. Um, Perfection of his form, so he looked perfect. Yep. Yeah, but is that like a quality? Perfection? Well, yeah, that's something that can, comes when we reach at one moment with God. Our form is perfected. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're all waiting for, you reckon, Deb? Yeah. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> I wanted to respond to Deb's inquiry, and um, I am a recovered Catholic, <laughs> and... Um, there's a very strong understanding in the church that supplication comes from the fact that I am not worthy. Yes. I am not worthy of your grace. I am not worthy of your love. And that's how you pray. Right. So maybe we've really hit on to why this word supplication is used. Because there's none of that. that. Is, he's, saying, he's not saying, I'm not worthy. He's saying, I'm worthy I and here worthy. I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Nina. <laughs> Um, what I wrote about that was when you were talking before about the perfection of nature and the building in it, I wrote that nothing in God's design is overridden in favour of another and how I do this with my brothers and sisters, how I accept and favour one over the other, mm -hmm. not fully realising that we are all creations of the one God and therefore loved equally. Yeah, yeah. Lovely reflection, Nina. 
And you, we see that all through the chapter, actually, don't we? We see it with the, na- the creations in nature. Then we see it in the chorale where all of the nations are, the former nations are together. And then we see it in the way that they sing. There's no star, is there? They're all working together. No one is more honoured than the other. They're all a part of the creation of the music. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, Araya, yeah. Where we are next? Well, and typically supplication has an implication of on your knees begging. Yes. Like you would supplicate to a king for mercy. Yes. Or, and this he's, beg- not, he's not on his knees begging. He's up there just announcing almost. Yeah. 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 Jen. <laughs> Where it says, all his majesty of Mien... I couldn't get a meaning for that. What do you feel? Do you know? That I means? just read it now, and I was like, "Oh, I didn't look that up either." It's does it, um, uh, Diana? Here, yeah, yeah. Does it mean? Um, I had a feeling of it when I read it, but it, I can't remember. It means personal bearing or manner. yes, that's what I thought. So the way he's holding himself. Yeah. Okay. Alex. I was just uh, thinking of the prayer, yeah, and um, and how Simon is totally typifies that in um, help us to know that we are the greatest of your creation, the most wonderful of your handiworks, yes, and not the subservient creatures that our exactly. false teachers have us believe, not like, the supplicating, yeah, exactly, people. yeah, yeah. So I yeah. just it totally typifies. And that. let me yeah. have such faith as will cause me to realise that I truly am your child. That's what he has, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But but. Because I've been confused about this in the past and, and this childlikeness. Yeah. And then I'm drawn to like Paul's words in, in Corinthians yeah. where he says, you know, when I became a man, I left behind my childlike ways. So that the childlike heart remains, yet I became a man. Mm-hmm. D- 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 it's, it just feels totally different for me. You, know, uh, you mean in Corinthians you've... You find it hard to understand the meaning. No, no, like that's you what get I get drawn it. to. Yeah, yes, and the, the, yes. the truth of that. Yeah, you know, and I feel like for the past couple of years, I, I felt like this um, going towards God is this vulnerability, is this fearful, um, small place that I have to kind of go. And now I'm, I'm starting to, to to feel, and and through Siamese's example, seeing the truth that it's it's not like that. It's no. it's a powerful place of yeah. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. It, it feels so, sometimes I feel powerless because yeah. I can't use my earthly defence mechanisms against the emotion, <laughs> against anyone else. I can't do those things when I want to go towards God, so I often feel powerless. But if I surrender to that, there's the power. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, Alex, you say that because sometimes I look at grown-ups and I think, they're acting so childishly and I look at children and I go, that's quite grown up what you're doing right there. And it's a sort of a strange, and I always think at the end of Corinthians where he talks about that or the end of the you know common passage in Corinthians where he talks about that, I always think, yeah, the ways of the child, I often think of that as the way we act on earth now. It's so... It's this, you know, childish thing. And when we grow and learn about love, we become this mature person who actually acts like a child would. But, yeah, it's kind of a flip over. Yeah. Okay, there's more qualities I've got here. There's a really key one that he really demonstrates right in the middle of the... um, in the middle of the page, in the second paragraph. It's three major paragraphs, so... Uh, yep, if we go to Alwyn, is that? Intense earnestness. Intense earnestness, yep. So he's, yep, and uh, right after that, what else is there? It's more, it's not actually, descri- it's, we see it through what he's saying, so there's no, it's not used, yeah, if we go to die, yep. He's expressing his love to God, his yep. love and... His adoration of God and that God is the one with the power and the and the glory and the might, not him. Yes. So he's he's honouring and respecting God and loving God. What else? Um, so all of these are right. Um, Julie? He's thankful. Yes. 
He's incredibly grateful, isn't he? And this, to me, is a huge element of um, what comes as we grow towards God, you know, as we, as we grow towards God. And I feel like when we're really close to God, when we're at one with God, we're full of gratitude. Um, and, and we see that, you know, he's, he's saying, you know, you're great and everything, but um, what does he say that I really felt it in? He's acknowledging what God has given, which shows his gratitude. And he said, he pour, this is now towards the end of the page, he paused to lay his weapons at the feet of him for whose glory he was about to fight to thank his king for the use of such victorious arms. Stunning. Yeah. So, you know, he's, thank, he's saying, I'm so grateful to you, God, that you would even bestow on me the power to use your love through me. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And there's one last quality that I had written down myself. It's at the end of the page. Jen? I was just going to refer to um, pride and arrogance that he didn't... He didn't have that, no. He was humble, yeah. That's not the one you were thinking of? That's not the one I was thinking of, but it's not wrong. (laughs) Thanks, Anto. When he said uh, he knew the answer would not tarry and when it came, it should find him waiting to receive it. Exactly. So what is he? He's willing to receive. That's pretty crucial, isn't it? If we're going to ask for God's help, we've got to be willing to receive it. And yeah, yeah. Joy? And even more than that, expecting to receive it. And to me, Mary, it's the difference between being self-reliant and God-reliant. Like if I'm, when I was self-reliant, as I've been all my life, yeah. it's that, and that's why we feel we have to supplicate because I'm not worthy and I can't do this and et cetera, et cetera. But when I focus on, well, I'm just the vessel and God's going to yeah. provide the magic... That's the God reliance. Totally. And you know, what, you know what I catch in myself is like, I'm the creator of me. You know, therefore I'm this, this, this and this. God reliance is, oh no, <laughs> he created me. I've got no idea what I'm going to be. I've just got to submit, you know, to myself and I'll, I'll discover it. But we, we're so trained to create ourselves, aren't we? And to create the construct of who we are and we defend it and we, you know, try and make it better and build on it. But all the while, it's just forgetting that God already put a personality in that soul. We've just got to heal the error and it'll come out of us naturally. We won't have to do any hard labour to get it. The only thing we have to do is grieve. Yeah. And when I had this realisation, from watching a movie actually, um, I realised that in my whole life I'd never really been truly grateful to God and all that he'd given because I'd always thought it was me doing the doing and not coming from God. Yes, Mm. yeah, yeah, very common that we think that, hey, I I achieve this, I'm very good, yep, and when times are tough, God, you did this and you suck. (laughs) God, where are you? Yes. Now I need you. Yeah. Yep. And I should say also I said all we have to do is grieve, but that's not it. We've got to involve God. You know, we've got to ask God. Be willing to receive his answers. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought that was a really powerful example of, um, you know, faith in action and what works. We have an example there purely, like, very well described of the qualities that he has in order to receive these healing powers from God. Pierre, you had your hand up. I have a question about sanction. So he's close with authority authority and sanction. Where is that? Um, I have a printout uh, on the top of page 64 on the printout version. No need to wait longer when closed with such authority and sanction. Uh, It's down the prayer, like two paragraphs. Down yep. the prayer. Well, the paragraph is starting with his steady gaze still rested. On, yeah. Oh, thank 73, you. So thank far. you. Cool. Uh, 
No need to wait longer when clothed with such authority and sanction. Um, the way I understand that is sanction is when you uh, have been given permission. Is that how everyone else understands it? Yes. So he's been, he was clothed in such authority and sanction it's from God. So he'd received from God the authority to do this healing and the permission to do it. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. No yeah. worries. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that part? No? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sam, and then back to Joy. I was just wondering, is this something that happens to every soul in a very poor condition once they decide to cross over the mists? Which like this, bit, This Sam? actual healing process? This corral, no. What, we what talked about that a bit last week. Oh. That's all right. Um, it's actually been performed upon people who have... Um, specifically been quite constrained in their life. So they haven't used their will in, in order to... Um, they've had... Okay, start from the beginning. They've had a sense of love and they've wanted to lovingly challenge the society in which they live in, so challenge the error in the society that they live in. They've been kind of independent thinkers from the rest of society and they've been constricted because of that, like they've been... Um, limited in the way that they're able to express that and because of that they have all these kind of um, damage to their spirit body because they haven't submitted their will so if they'd submit like last week we talked a lot about how many of us and I included myself in that we've submitted our will in order to get approval from people we've gone okay all right that feels a bit wrong but I really want you to like me so I'm gonna you know make a you know make an exception to what I feel is truthful or loving or, or whatever, or I'll ignore the conscience inside of me in order to um, get approval or safety or whatever it is. And these people are people who didn't willingly do that. So they never really used their... If they had, they would have had a different spirit body and their soul condition would have been worse. But because they never had, they are just bearing the injuries of things that... The pains that had been placed upon them because they had never submitted their will. And for that reason, they're able to help alleviate some of those things and remove them. The people will still have their own soul condition to deal with and their own grief about those things. But the, the things that we're seeing physically removed are actually just um, the results of having a restricted life. So last time we talked about political prisoners, uh, other things that came to mind were like women in Fred's time, you know, so that where they weren't able to have independent means very easily, they were often, or women who were married very young in, you know, in situations where they had no choice and things like that. When yeah. something was imposed upon them. Yeah. And they're, they're, it's only those wounds that are being healed in this. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Jen? In the paragraph that starts, his prayer was done, it said... It says, God requires no superfluities. Yep. What, what, is a su what would be an example of a superfluity? I, I feel it's about flowery language. It's, it's about, you know, I don't have to suck up to God, basically, or tell him he's wonderful, or in, in a um, false or flowery kind of a way. But Glenda looks like she's looked it up. So let's ask her, <laughs> or she knows it because she's just clever. It's superlatives, and it comes from the word yeah. um, superfluous. Super, yes. So something that's overdone. Yep. Like in church, oh, we're not worthy for this, we're not worthy for that. And it's really overdone. Exactly. It's like, I love your top. No, really, it's beautiful. No, it's gorgeous. No, I, that colour really does it for you. you know, it's no, too much. really. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's sort of fake. It, it's fake and over the top. So God doesn't require those things. That's what it means. And that's different from... I do like your top, by the way. But, <laughs> um, that's different from heartfelt gratitude, which is what he's displaying. But he doesn't... Uh, the difference I see, Jen, is that when you have a heartfelt gratitude, it's inherent in everything that you do and it's, it's coming out of you and you don't have to rave on about it that much. You might, you might put it into words, as he does, but... You don't have to force it out because it's just 
there all the time. And it's also in your actions as well as your words. From your heart, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Deb? Um, what I under, understood about the, in addition to what, what we were talking about last week, about the political prisoners, the type of people that might yep. get that um, healing, I understood he was talking about mediums. Uh, mediums. I thought he made it... I th to me, it was quite clear he was talking about mediums who, who were silenced, who were not allowed to speak out against the church. OK, where did you see that, Deb? Um, gosh, am I the only one who saw that? Um, I must have made it up. Um, <laughs> it, it, it talks about... The, I don't know where it is right now, but it's a craft, um, true to a craft. They, they were silenced um, yeah, I, because of the church, the power of the church. I don't feel that it's specifically about mediums, although I think that they could fall into that category. Um, but it's talking about people who were silenced by the church because remember in this time, the church controlled a lot of society. Uh, here we go. Their prophetic utterances were dangerous to a craft, hence the gag must be applied. Yeah, is no, not, this no. is a metaphor, I feel. Oh. Um, prophetic utterances. Think about this in terms of... Us. <laughs> to me, a prophetic utterance is a medium, you know. So you don't feel that you can say a truth about the world and the way it exists and what will happen as a natural result of continuing to live in error just from your own knowledge of the truth and God. Now, that can be prophetic, but you're not using mediumship to, to mm -hmm. say it. Okay. It's a metaphor. Probably because it, he talks a lot in, I think, the second book about pro, um, the prophets in the, in the Old Testament being mediums. Yeah. So I kind of, yeah. Yeah, which they, like which they were. Um, but this is much more all-encompassing, the description he's trying to give here. He's trying to talk about a group of people who are saying to the world, this is not going to work. What you're doing here... This is bad. This is wrong. This is going to lead to hardship. This is, this is not going to work out in the long run. And they're silenced because of that. Yeah. Thank you. Now, mediums could fall into that, but he's definitely speaking about a broad... In all humility, I feel he's definitely speaking about a broader... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I could be wrong, but yeah. All right. So now we're about ready to get on to the meaty part of the chapter. <laughs> And it's quarter to five. And I haven't been sweating it because I think it's great that everyone's engaged and I don't need control. And also I know we're going to focus on this next week as well. I just wondered if we should just gently introduce this part of the chapter in the last 15 minutes so that we can all kind of begin stewing on it for the next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, did anyone re did anyone reread the chapter in the last five days? Awesome! So some of you <laughs> can I recommend rereading it um, before next week? Because yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. So where does it get real serious? Page seventy six and seventy seven, I think, of the published book. I'm sorry, I don't have a printout. 68 on the printout, yep. So initially he talks about the, what um, Julie spoke about earlier, that the facade is gone. I think that's my favourite part of this chapter where he talks about, that's it, the real man can be seen. And, um, and there is a balancing of accounts and a righteous retribution for the deeds done in the body. Um, so there's some strong language getting used here already. Can anyone have a, have a crack at just summarising the, I know this is a big ask, but the truths or the lessons that, I think it's, you're talking to Siamedes here? Yes, yeah, Siamedes is trying to point out to him about the action of mercy and justice um, and life on earth. But he also talks about repentance and the law of compensation. So there's a lot in there. But who wants to have a crack at that? <laughs> Not you. No. <laughs> Come on. It's okay. <laughs> Just to get the ball rolling. Come on, Lily. 
<laughs> All right. I'll, I guess it's up to me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'll have a small crack at it. When I first read this, I was like, I'm going to look up mercy because I like mercy. <laughs> you know, I like this idea of mercy and this idea that... So what's being presented to Fred is that God is demonstrating mercy on earth and when we pass, there will be justice and there will be an account for everything that you've done and he's also saying that it will be like a slow grinding, you know, of the wheels of justice, basically. Um, uh, we said it earlier. Um, you know, he's saying that there, it will be a slow process where you're going to have to face what you've done. Then he goes on and talks about um, repentance and forgiveness and there's a lot in that as well that we probably have to talk about next week. But he says, when the penalty for sins against his fellow has been righteously discharged, then the repentant soul has power to ask for forgiveness for his sin against God, which is always freely granted, but it is requisite that he first be reconciled to his brother. For only he that clean hands and a pure heart can, can ascend to the presence of God where Christ will secure his full remission. So I'd love for you to ponder about this idea before next week. This idea that first we must be, um, well, what does he say exactly? I don't want to, we must be reconciled to our brother before true forgiveness from God can happen. Yes, that's true, Rita. It's saying, first your brother must forgive you before God can. Yes, you're right. So think about that um, because there is, there's a lot of meaning we need to talk about in that. So, But just reflect on what you feel about that. And also, if you can reflect on the idea of mercy, not, mercy existing here on earth and not in the spirit world, and justice existing in the spirit world. Firstly, what feelings does that bring up for you? And I'll, I'll tell you the definition I found of mercy that placated me somewhat, because um, the first definition I had was compassion, compassionate or kindly forbearance shown towards an offender or enemy or other person in one's power, compassion, pity or benevolence. And I thought, oh, I like compassion. Why don't we have that in the spirit world? But then, <laughs> then I got to what it was really on about. Yeah. <laughs> the discretionary power of a judge to pardon someone or to mitigate punishment, especially to send to prison rather than invoke the death penalty. So it's talking about mitigating the consequences, basically. So it's saying that here on earth, there is that action in place. But when we pass into the spirit world, that no longer exists. So that idea brought up a lot of emotions for me. I don't know if it, if it will for you, but um, to really have a think about that from all angles is, a, is my suggestion. Um, yeah, and I think then he talks about the qualities of true justice, which we can talk about next week. But those are the two main questions I thought would be good for you to think about. Um, so firstly, that... Um, I must first of I still want to say I must first have forgiven my brother, but it is requisite that he first be reconciled to his brother. It, can I? Is Who's it? yes? Go. Who's that? Got the microphone? <laughs> uh, yeah, Kelly. <laughs> go. Isn't that um, him being repentant first, and his brother feeling that, and it being resolved, and then receiving God's love? Is that the... Yeah, well, I've written what I feel the true meaning is, but then I think I'm giving... I've written, we must first have forgiven our brother for the harm that he has done against us. We must be reconciled with our brother. That's what I feel that it's saying. Depending who caused the harm. Well, it says, when the penalty for sins against his fellow has been righteously discharged. So that's the penalty. 
Then the repentant soul, again him, has the power to ask forgiveness for his sin against God, which is always freely granted, but it is requisite that he first be reconciled to his brother. So again, it's talking about the sin I've committed against my brother, and it's saying that um, when the penalty for that sin has been discharged, then I can ask for my forgiveness with God, but first I must be reconciled to my brother. So I'm, yeah, I must, so the penalty for sins against his fellow, I must have asked for my brother's forgiveness. I feel that's what it means, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Sorry. Yep. Jen at the back. Do you feel that maybe that when sin's committed, whichever way it goes, me against my brother or my brother against me, that that kind of drives a wedge in our relationship or the way in which we relate to each other. Yes. And so if we're truly repentant, then we'll no longer have a a stiff distinction or a difference between um, myself or my brother. So... Well, when we're truly repentant, the wedge, if you like, would be gone. Would be lifted. Yes. So Even if it's not gone from the other end. And this is the interesting part about forgiveness if, and repentance. If we look at it from either end, forgiveness or repentance, once we've forgiven or truly <coughs> repented, say I hurt Barbara... Um, or she hurts me, oh gosh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Say I hurt Barbara, um, there's a wedge between us if you like. If I truly repent about that, that wedge or that distance I feel from her, which would be a lot about avoidance of what I've done or shame about what I've done, justification of what I've done, all of these things, I will have resolved all of those things, grieved what I've done to her and I will naturally want to come back closer to her. I might not you know, want to be in her life forever and ever, amen. But uh, the wedge, the emotional wedge would be gone from my end. It doesn't mean Barbara might not have forgiven me, so she might still have a wedge. Once she forgives, no wedges. So somehow... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, That's all right. Uh, Go, go, Jen. So somehow... Um, well, the question is, without trying to guess, where does God come into it then? If there's a wedge between me and my brother because I've acted wrongly and I come to re- the place of repentance and forgiveness of self and whatever's gone down the line, yeah. then it seems that God is enabled to act well, Jennifer, the- thank you for asking that question because yeah. you did it more eloquently than I and that is the question that I wanted everyone to go home with. <laughs> Which is all about the action of forgiveness and repentance, how it impacts upon our relationship with each other and how God, how is God involved in that and how can we involve God in it and <coughs> how can God act in that place? What are the preconditions inside of us. See, Jen was much more eloquent still. Um, do you understand the question? Mon, no? What don't you understand? It is, it's not going to have a yes or no answer. It's just a reflection thing. Yeah. It's all right? Do you get it, Alex? Can you? Yeah. Cool. All right. May I ask another question, please? Yes. It might be the other homework question, which would be fantastic. <laughs> Um, uh, why is there a distinction between mercy and justice? Why has God... Jennifer, that is the second homework question. I love it. (laughs) Beautiful. Is everyone clear on the homework? Because Jen did it for me. I didn't have to. I muddled through it, but she did it. (laughs) So... Does everyone get the two questions? It's just, no, no one's got it. That's right. It's just to reflect on the distinction, the difference between mercy and justice and their actions on earth and in the spirit world. To try to understand those differences and understand why. Why is that happening? 
Second question is a little more vague. It's all about the wedges. <laughs> it's all about um, forgiveness and repentance. So in our relationships with our brothers and sisters, how that action works. And then he's, he's trying to draw out a point with God. Like, how, how does God feel about these things? Like, when do we receive God's forgiveness? So remember he says... You can't ask for God's forgiveness until you've asked for forgiveness from your brother or you've forgiven your brother, is basically what he's saying. It works on both sides. So just to reflect about that, that's quite a big thing, statement. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for today. Um, Yeah. Thanks for being such a beautiful audience. Yeah. Or you're not audience, you're participants. That's yeah. Mon, did you have a last question? What What's the question? If you, I, I just can't understand the, the first the the question that you just said last. Even though Alex tried to explain it. Do you under, Do you understand any part of it? Like what part do you understand? Um, there's repentance and there's forgiveness. Yes. And we're looking at the wedge. Yes. But. How does God come into that? Yeah, so in the passage it says that we cannot ask and receive we cannot ask for God's re- forgiveness and receive it until we have first forgiven or been for- no, first forgiven our brother. Or repented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So my, my, really my question is for you guys to reflect on that and try to understand it because it's a big truth. No, not clear? Still not clear. No. Yeah. Okay. It's not very clear? It's very clear. Okay. Yep. So Mon's just an emotion there that's blocking you understanding. Just pray and yeah, yeah. All right, guys. See you next Thursday. We thought we might have maybe uh, karaoke after next Thursday. If you're up for it. <laughs> we're, we're going away again for another month after that, so I wanted to say. <laughs> no, nobody's excited. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your participation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>